Okay, thank you for the introduction. So I'd like to start with uh, pointing out the motivation behind this work. And the goal is to uh, do a modeling of resonator viscosity and mass density sensors. So the goal of the model should be to predict the sensor response in terms of the resonance frequency and quality factor independent of the quantities to be measured. Well, with such a model, one could optimize the measurement range and resolution for specific applications. And just to mention a few, we'd like to use these sensors for diagnostic tools for body fluids, monitor phase transitions, and analyze the microstructure of complex liquids like emulsions, suspensions, or polymeric solutions. So I'll give a quick overview about uh, resonator viscosity sensors. So commonly used are either cantilevers, flexural plates, or tuning fork setups, also torsional cylinders, or um, piezoelectric devices, either based on the thickness shear quartz or the surface guided wave. We mainly worked on either uh, micro machines, devices uh, yeah, like these cantilever devices or uh, doubly clamped switch structures or these micro machined plate resonators. But uh, miniaturization in that case was not always the best idea, so we uh, scaled up a little bit to make them more uh, um, handle able uh, in the application and we used uh, basically uh, similar structures um, but at larger sizes. So to show a few uh, examples of these devices, so this is a, a, a plate resonator in silicon technology which is actuated by Lorentz forces and read out um, with uh, piezo resistors at the end of these springs. So this upscaled version, so in the range of uh, 10 millimeters, are these millimeter-sized plate resonators uh, are in, yeah, completely metallic technology. And this is another form of it, which is uh, meant not to completely immerse the, the sensor, but to just put a droplet on the resonator to minimize the necessary uh, sample volume. Our devices are uh, U-shaped beam resonators or this macroscopic tuning fork, so a real musical tuning fork immersed in the liquid, also actuated um, with uh, magnetic forces and read out by electrodynamic uh, pickup. And this device will serve as a um, uh, the sensor to, to verify our model. So the approach is to start with an uh, eigenmode decomposition of, um, of this uh, mechanical structure. And if you do this, you can calculate for each eigenmode, so each resonance frequency and effective stiffness and an effective mass. So usually this is done um, with finite elements. And then you can do an integration over the whole structure and calculate um, these parameters. Then you can formulate the equation of motion. So in F is the actuation force, V the velocity, and then M, C, and K are the mass uh, intrinsic damping parameter and the stiffness K. And we introduced the fluid loading by a complex fluid impedance, which is called Z here which has a real and imaginary part. And if you know uh, the values of this, you can calculate the resonance frequency and the damping in case of fluid loading. So omega r is uh, the reson angular resonance frequency. So finally, you will end up uh, with a loaded resonance frequency in that form, depending on the real part of the fluid impedance and the quality factor depending on the imaginary part of this fluid impedance. And the question now is, um, what is, how does this uh, complex fluid impedance set depend on the fluid parameters and on the geometry? And for this, we use this decomposed form 
um, where we take out the fluid parameters. Rho is the uh, mass density of the fluid, eta is the viscosity. And um, the influence of the geometry is modeled by um, three parameters, namely the, an effective fluid volume and effective uh, interaction area of um, shear wave and an effective uh, viscous dissipation length. So why do we use this form? This is um, yeah, on one side inspired by devices that are specifically designed in a way to um, make one of these terms dominant. The first example, as we also saw in the previous talk, is a mass density sensor based on oscillating tube structures. And there, this effective fluid volume is just the complete um, volume of the fluid that is moving in the channel. On the other hand, the um, shear wave interaction area is the dominant influence influence on uh, thickness shear mode quartz resonators, which are um, yeah, very large area devices, and the penetration depth is rather small. So the other terms in the complex fluid impedance are uh, close to zero. And the viscous uh, dissipation length scale is uh, dominant if you have um, a small gap and a linear shear gradient between uh, two parallel walls, um, like it is used in um, standard rheometers, and it's usually known as the quad flow. And this effective uh, dissipation length is not the gap size, but it's the uh, area of the plate divided by the gap size. Yeah, so these are um, devices uh, where only one of these parameters is uh, dominant. If you have an object that is completely immersed in the fluid and is carrying out an oscillation, you can calculate um, these parameters analytically for uh, some uh, ideal geometries. In the case of a sphere, you get up these values. In the uh, case of a cylinder, these values. In the case of a uh, flat blade, you get these parameters where you have uh, some numerical parameters, um, yeah, which are derived from the analytical model yeah, that was uh, introduced by uh, John Sader. So our approach is um, a kind of a semi-numerical approach. So first we start with this um, eigen mode decomposition. Then we have the mode shape. And for the um, fluid volume, we start with an uh, yeah, approximation in the form of a potential flow solution, which is usually used for inviscid um, liquids. So the point is that for the velocity, you uh, solve only one scalar equation, the flow potential. And the equation you have to solve is just Laplace equation with appropriate boundary conditions that come from the mode shape. Yeah, in the case of a cylindrical cross section, it looks somehow like this. And one property of this potential flow solution is that uh, you can only prescribe the normal component of the flow velocity, but the tangential component, which um, is determined by the no-slip condition, usually cannot be fulfilled by the potential flow solution. Uh, another approach would be to solve the uh, full uh, equations, but full equations are not the complete Navier-Stokes equations. They are the uh, linearized Navier-Stokes equations where the uh, convective term is uh, neglected due to the small amplitude of oscillation. So, of course, the full equations can fulfill all uh, boundary conditions correctly. And the difference between the uh, full equations and the potential flow is mainly on the boundary as expected. And if you look closer into the 
um, different solutions. It will um, more or less like look like um, a shear wave that um, yeah is responsible for the difference between the this approximation and the and the real one. Uh, from the potential flow solution, you uh, directly can calculate the effective fluid volume by integration over the uh, surface. Uh, for the shear wave interaction, which of course is not completely um, uh, solved for by the uh, potential flow solution, uh, you can also do that. Um, and the idea behind this is that to uh, get the um, correct solution, we start with potential flow and correct the boundary condition by a superposition with appropriate scaled uh, shear wave solution. Yeah, and also you can calculate the effective um, length scale. Yeah, for the uh, 2D model, um, we directly can compare the analytical solution, in that case um, a cylindrical model. So I used a cylinder with one millimeter diameter, calculated uh, these values and compared to the terms that I get from the uh, finite element solution. And you see they are really close to each other. Um, and yeah, the advantage of using the potential flow solution is that you only have to need to solve for uh, one scalar field in uh, comparison to the three velocity components and all the stresses. Okay, um, now I want to know if this method also works for uh, three-dimensional structures of, of arbitrary geometry. And um, my colleague Martin uh, set up this sensor device and the advantage is that with this um, microscopic tuning fork um, you can uh, you can very uh, accurately measure the uh, geometry and you have a very stable operation um, due to the uh, yeah, well-defined uh, clamping in that in the uh, oscillation nodes and of course temperature is well controlled and the liquids that are used um, were compared to a laboratory method so here's the uh, finite element model. We start with the eigenmode analysis with the potential flow around it. And these are the uh, experimentally determined values. So Martin used um, a series which had the same mass density but different viscosity and one series of fluids that have the same viscosity but different um, mass density. Yeah, from this measurement you can calculate these uh, three parameters for the effective fluid volume, area, and length scale, and compare it to the simulation. And so this is resonance frequency independence of density and viscosity and the damping. And they are um, yeah, pretty close to each other. Also, uh, I'm not very satisfied with this uh, deviation, um, which... Uh, could be the, the cost of this could be the, uh, that the discretion, discretization was still not sufficient for the potential flow solution. Yeah, and here is the comparison between the experiment analytical and the finite element model. And what's interesting is that this analytic solution for the cylinder is uh, actually for some of these parameters closer to the experiment than the finite element solution. Okay, I think I'm almost at the end of the time, so I just present uh, the summary and the outlook um, here on this slide, and uh, thank the team and uh, the Lind Center of Mechatronics for funding. Thank you.